the letter as well as then looking at the first four verses. So 1 John chapter 1, let's hear the word of God. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So reads the word of God. We're going to uh, pray now and the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your word. We know that it is a light and a lamp. We know that sometimes it comes to us like a sword and it cuts us to the quick. We know that it shows us what is right and what is wrong, how to get right with you and how to stay right with you. We know that it speaks of Jesus who loves us. So we pray that you would take of your word tonight in the hands of the Holy Spirit, would you write it on our hearts that we might not sin against you by our unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen. So over this week and next, as Phil mentioned, we are starting our, I think I call them spring series when we sent the uh, the thing through to John, but it's more like winter series, isn't it really? Spring's nowhere near yet. It's getting colder. God willing, next Sunday morning, we'll be starting a series in the Lord's Prayer and particularly looking at our relationship with God as we find it there in the Lord's Prayer. And we'll see how every part of the prayer that Jesus taught Uh, is rich in terms of revealing the wonderful relationship that the believer has with God. That's in the mornings. Don't miss it. You'll miss out if you miss coming. And on Sunday evenings, we'll be studying this first letter of John under the title of Life, Light and Love. And as we make our way through the letter, we'll find gems in every chapter. Chapter 1. I'm just picking one verse out here from each chapter. You could go through the whole lot. But chapter one, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Great verse. Chapter two, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Chapter three, I think I spoke on this last year sometimes. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Chapter 5. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And I know I've mentioned that uh, famous story uh, about the, the, the guy who got the, the art collection previously when I've spoken on that uh, passage. There is treasure in all scripture. And here in John's letter, uh, the first letter, it's lying close to the surface. We don't have to start going and digging for it. We don't need to be an Andrew Wickstrom with our metal detector to find the gems in God's word. So I wanted to just try and set the letter in its context tonight and then take a a quick look at the first four verses. Uh, The prologue, uh, the introduction to everything else that John says. So let's ask a few questions. Who wrote it? Who was it written to? And why was it written? Well, who wrote the letter? The normal convention was that uh, they turned things around from the way that we do things. We leave it from Brian at the end of the letter. But in all the other letters, apart from Hebrews in the New Testament, uh, the the person who sent the letter, they, they introduced themselves at the beginning. Paul, James, Peter, Jude, they all announced themselves. 
by name in the first verse of their letters, to be a servant or an apostle of Christ. But there's no such announcement here. However, there can be little doubt, if any at all, of the author of, this, of the three letters of John here. It was the Apostle John. Not only did the early church historians accept that, but there are so many parallels when you look through the first letter of John particularly. Thought and expression uh, that we find not only here in the first letter, but also in the Gospel of John. Just take those three things that we've used as our heading, life, light, and love. In the Gospel of John, in him was life, right at the beginning. And the life was the light of men. John 3.16 speaks about how we get that life. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish and not just have life, but have everlasting life. The I am's that we studied before Christmas speak of the bread of life, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, the good shepherd who gives his life. And John 10 reveals the purpose that Jesus came. I have come that they might have life. We find life uh, as a, uh, a thread running through John's letter and John's gospel. Just about the same number of references in John's gospel to life as all the other three gospels put together. It's the same with light. Jesus is the true light, the light that has come into the world, the light of the world. We find all of those in his gospel. We find them again in the letter. And then there's love. The gospel of John is sometimes called the gospel of love. And there are actually more references to love in the gospel of John than in all the other three gospels put together. John is known as the disciple who Jesus loved. And again, there are more references, as I've said, in the gospel to the other three put together to this wonderful thought of love. Put this together with the fact that the writer describes himself as an eyewitness to the things that he's seen, the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And the early Christian historians and tradition ascribes the letter, all three letters, to the Apostle John. So who wrote the letter? The Apostle John. The one who, with Peter and James, was present with Jesus at the raising of Jairus' daughter back to life. The transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain when, for a short time, the veil was drawn back and they saw something of his glory. He with James and John uh, were sat there with the Lord Jesus Christ asking questions on the Mount of Olives. They were there in the Garden of Gethsemane going further on than the rest of the disciples. Here was a man who was close to Jesus. John, the, the disciple who is described as the one, the disciple that Jesus loved. He would rest his head on the Lord's shoulder. And by the time this letter was written, John must have been very old. And possibly one of the last, possibly the last of the 12 who initially followed Jesus. And he would have been a figure of some authority in the church. John, the one who, I think it was Jerome, uh, described as every time they brought him on his seat into a room and put him down. And they asked him for a word and he just said, love one another, little children. That was all he said. Uh, because he said, if you do that, then you will do everything that's required. Who did John write the letter to? Well, there's no address C in the letter. So it's difficult to, to say this person or that locality. But after the ascension, we know that John stayed in Jerusalem for a while. You can read about him in, in, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles. And church history tells us that he moved to Ephesus uh, when the, um, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed and the church was scattered. And it's recorded that he remained in and around Ephesus until around about the turn of the first century, busy in the church. So the letter appears to have been written to the local churches around Ephesus. 
but we can pick up some real pointers from the letter itself. He was obviously very close to the people he was writing to. Look at the language he used. Seven times in the letter, he refers to my little children. <laughs> Those are the ones he's writing to. It's not something that you just use as an expression when you don't know the people very well. Twice he refers to them just as children. Six times he refers to them as beloved or dear friends. And he calls them fathers and young men. So he was obviously very close to the people he was writing to. And we know that he was writing to those who had already become Christians. They'd heard the gospel and they'd responded. Three times he refers to the message which you have heard. And he tells us at the end of the letter in chapter 5 and verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So written by John, written to believers, members of the churches who he was very close to. Third question then, why? Why was the letter written? Well, simply put, the church was under attack. The New English Bible, it's strange, isn't it? The, the translations come out and they call it the New English Bible. It's probably 60 years old now and it's not the New English Bible anymore. There's plenty more newer ones. But anyway, the New English Bible um, titles the letter A Recall to Fundamentals which captures the sense of the letter pretty well, I think. The Christian church, not even 100 years old, is under a significant attack. And time after time, John tells the believers why he is writing. Sometimes he writes to encourage them, and sometimes he says he's writing to warn them. I'm writing, he says, because you know Jesus, the one who is from the beginning. I'm writing because you have overcome the evil one. Well done. I'm writing because you know the Father. Isn't that great? I'm writing because you are strong, because the word of God abides in you. Wonderful. I'm writing because you know the truth. But there's warning there as well. I'm writing because there are those who want to deceive you. And finally, he wants them to have assurance to be certain that they are Christians and they have eternal life. Do you remember in John's Gospel uh, why uh, he gives us a, a, an idea of why he wrote the Gospel? John chapter 20 and verse 31. These are written so that you may believe, he says, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel is written so that those who don't yet believe might come to faith. But the letter's slightly different. We referred to it already, chapter 5 and verse 13 of the letter. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so you already believe that you may know that you have eternal life. He's writing so that these Christians who are under attack, who he loves and he knows so well, might have assurance in their faith. There's no need for new ideas. The attack is on the apostles' doctrine. That's what the attack uh, was all about. It's about the apostles' doctrine and its impact on Christian life and fellowship. There were false teachers, the Gnostics, who went around saying that they had received a special revelation from God, something new. And they said, we receive this by a special anointing. And all the wacky ideas that came with it, which we haven't got time to go through, but they will come up uh, as we go through the letter. And John wants to write to his beloved little children and say, you don't need anything that's new because Jesus has told it all. Those things which, which you know to be true from the, the apostles' doctrine, those things which we have seen and passed on to you, those words of Jesus which we have heard with our ears, there's no need for change, for any new revelation, any new experience. And don't we need to be so careful these days when people come along with very plausible sounding arguments of something new, a new tweak on our faith, which we don't find in the word of God. Look at the language that John uses in chapter 2 and verse 26. He says, 
I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. There were many heresies that needed to be countered. Next Sunday, God willing, we'll be looking at verses 5 to 10. Will Williams is doing that. Uh, and that's where John states unequivocally that if we claim, as some of these false teachers did, to be sinless, then we're deceiving ourselves. We're calling God a liar, and it proves that his word has no part in us. We are lost. And there'll be many more issues that we'll find as we go through the chapters of this letter. So here is error to be avoided. But also the letter shows us that the Christian life is essentially fellowship with God. That's what the Christian life is all about. And everything else that we do and know spins out from our fellowship with God. Fellowship with other Christians. It comes from our fellowship with God. And John gives us through this letter, look out for them. If it was Robbie to say, here's your own work. But look out for these three tests. First of all, he tests our doctrine. Do you believe what the gospel says about Jesus? Then he tests our relationships with each other. Do you love the brethren, the brothers and sisters, as you should? And then he tests our behavior. Do you live your lives in a way that is pleasing to God and is in accordance with his word? Three tests which we will see come up over and over again as we work our way through the letter. So who was it written by? The Apostle John. Who was it written to? His close friends, the believers in the local churches around Ephesus. And why was it written? So that they could be sure of their salvation. The salvation that they'd already uh, known about and heard about and, and cast themselves upon. There was no need for any of these heresies that were cropping up now, they remain faithful to the apostles' doctrine, sound and solid faith. That's by way of introduction. So let's look at the first four verses, the prologue, and see what specifically they teach us. John wants to lay a solid foundation for everything that he will go on to write. He wants his little children to continue in a faith that is based on truth. Now, you know I love Warren Wearsby, and I can't open the Bible and start to prepare anything. But I was at least giving him a quick look at in one of his commentaries. Uh, and I thought it was um, great what he said on his commentary to First John. He says this, Once upon a time, remember how exciting those words used to be? They were the open door into an exciting world of make-believe, a dream world that helped you forget all the problems of childhood. Then, pow, you turned the corner one day and once upon a time became kid stuff. You discovered that life is a battleground, not a playground, and fairy stories were no longer meaningful. You wanted something real. Isn't that true? When we are children, everything is all about make-believe. It's all about imagination and excitement. The little granddaughter was uh, with us over Christmas and she sees crocodiles and dinosaurs in all sorts of places where they can't even see anything. Imagination's a wonderful thing, but as we grow up, we realize that that's not what life is all about. And that we can't base our life uh, on fairy tales, on once upon a time. We need solid truth. And John wants to give them something real, something that will stop them from being like children who are tossed about to and fro with every wind of doctrine, as Paul says to the Ephesian church. So John starts by laying a solid foundation. And I just want to look, there's so much in these verses, but just the three things that he particularly picks out. The focus of these verses is Jesus, the word of life. Foundation number one, the eternal son of God. And the old, old story. The letter starts with a parallel thought to the opening words of John's gospel that I read at the beginning of the service. In the gospel, John speaks about the existence of Jesus before the foundation of the world. He talks about the eternal son of God who dwelt with us full of grace and truth and we beheld his glory. And John starts his letter in a similar way 
that which was from the beginning, dot, 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 concerning the word of life. John points us now not only to the one who was in the beginning, the eternal son of God, the one who was made flesh and dwelt amongst men, but also he points us to the message of the gospel, the message of eternal life through Jesus Christ, which was what they had heard in the beginning. The eternal son of God and the old, old story. Listen, says John. You can't afford to get it wrong when it comes to what you think and believe about Jesus. Don't listen to the false teachers who will tell you that he is anything less than God the Son, which was another one of these false teachers' claims. Don't listen to the heretics who offer an easy-peasy Christianity mark too. The Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the message of the gospel are rooted together in eternity. They are unchanging and they are unchangeable. Have a look at what it says in verse 23 of chapter 2. No one who denies the Son has the Father. And then uh, chapter 5 and verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. If you don't have the Son, John says, you lose everything. If you don't have a, a proper view of who Jesus is, the eternal Son of God, who was contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man, lived amongst us for a while, went to a cross and died in our place. If you don't have a proper view of him, then you're lost. Be sure, says John, the one that you have already, from the beginning, put your trust in for salvation is the eternal, indispensable, unchanging Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, nothing. With him, you have everything. Foundation number two, the word of life was made manifest. Verse two, you see it there, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it. And in verses one and two, uh, John mentions the same sort of thing a couple of times, doesn't he? We heard him, we saw him, we looked upon him, we touched him. John says, the message that we brought to you was directly from him. It says that in chapter 1 and verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. The God is light in him, him is no darkness at all. It's not once upon a time, says John. This is solid reality. We heard Jesus, says John, not just his message, we heard his voice. We saw him with our eyes. We looked upon him. What a glorious sight it must have been there on the mountain when the Lord Jesus Christ was seen in something of his glory. Seeing is believing, says John. And we saw him. We add emphasis to our report. When we want people to really, really believe what we're saying, we add emphasis, don't we say, I saw it with my own eyes. You can't see it with anybody else's eyes, I don't suppose, but we saw it with our own eyes. For the avoidance of doubt is a phrase that I have to use at work quite a lot. Just as an aside, the, the contract is written in English by a Spanish lawyer using the French law. And the contractor is a Dutch conglomerate with a German specialist. And things get lost in translation. Now, I quite often find when I'm sending a communication to somebody, I have to put it in the contract speak, and then at the end I have to say, for the avoidance of doubt, this is what it really means. Putting it into layman's terms. And I can almost hear John thinking, well, you might say that we heard him from a distance. You might say that we just saw him with the crowd. <laughs> but for the avoidance of doubt, we actually touched him. Maybe John is thinking of the time in the upper room when... Uh, he lay his head, put his head back and lay on Jesus. Maybe he's thinking of Thomas putting his hand into the nail prints and the spear mark. And again, 
we use the same expression. It's a hands-on experience. Can I take you back to uh, the, the Gospels again? Matthew, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the story of the calling of those first disciples. Let's take you up in Mark chapter 1 and starting at verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he, that's Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Listen, says John, I used to be a fisherman on the lake. And then Jesus came, I saw him, and he spoke to me, and he said, follow me. And I followed him. And for the next three years, I followed him around, and I touched him, and I lived with him, and I saw that everything stacked up about what was said about him. It was real. John knows, because he wrote it down in his gospel, because he heard Jesus say it, that unless a man, a woman, a child is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. His own experience was a real encounter with Jesus. And I have to ask you, have you had a real encounter with the risen Jesus. I know it's been said many times, but it's worth repeating. You won't have eternal life because you came to Sunday school every, every week from when you were three to 33. You won't have eternal life because you come to a believing church or had Christian parents or gave freely and generously to the work of the church. You won't have eternal life because you were able to recite whole chunks of the, Bible, of the Bible off by heart. The only thing that counts is that you're born again. New life in Christ. The only way you can get it is through the cross. It's apprehended by you. As you confess that you are a sinner and throw yourself on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's paid for by him as he hung on the cross bearing in his body our sins on the tree, as the Apostle Peter said. I ask, will you come to him now, this very moment? You didn't have the blessing like John of being able to say, we saw him with our eyes, we, we, we listened to his voice, we touched him with our hands. But John has written his gospel so that you might believe. And he's written his letters so that you might be sure. Foundation three, the word of life is shared. Verse three, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you, also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We have shared this with you, says John, for fellowship and for joy. And the word fellowship is very precious. In its simplest form, it means having things in common with. You remember in Acts, the new Christians devoted themselves to the fellowship, as well as the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and prayers. And Dr. Luke spells out that they had all things in common. And as a result, read it at the end of Acts chapter 2. The needs of the fellowship of believers were met, hearts were warmed, God was praised, and souls were saved. And this introduction here, the idea of fellowship, also brings a different slant to our thinking. Doctrinal truth is so important, it's absolutely vital. But it's linked to daily life. What we believe will show in how we live. We are saved by grace, for instance, and remember when Paul talks about grace and he asks the question, should we therefore carry on sinning so that grace may abound? You know, more sin, more grace. And very quickly, he, he, he squashes it, doesn't he? By no means. How can we be who died to sin still live in it? And he goes on to say that we need to walk in newness of life. Now, says John, we have fellowship in two directions firstly with each other you with me me with you you all with each other it's horizontal fellowship if you like but also we have fellowship with god the father and with the lord jesus christ that's vertical fellowship it's in different dimensions 
It's an amazing thought to have fellowship with saved sinners. Well, I can understand that. That's fair enough. We're all the same. We're cast in the same mould. The sinners. We need salvation. We need help. We need encouragement. We need to trust in Christ. But John says something amazing here. He says, our fellowship is with God the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have nothing naturally in common with God. He is holy. We are sinful. He is the creator. We are the created. He is the righteous one. All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. But Jesus, the eternal and incarnate Son of God, went to the cross. He took the record of our sins, our debts, to the cross with him, and he nailed it there, and he marked it paid in full. And a great exchange took place, didn't it? As the spotless Lamb of God, the eternal word of life, took our sins and swapped them for his righteousness. Only through the cross can we have fellowship with the Father and the Son. Only through the cross can we have fellowship with each other. And the other effect is joy. It's a joy that David understood when he wrote, In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16. Joy is a wonderful part of the Christian life. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. It's not a happy, clappy joy that takes all your cares away. It's a deep-rooted joy that no matter what your circumstances and situations, no matter how dark the future might seem to you, there in your heart you know you are his. And he is yours forever. There were the odd occasions when I used to go out preaching and uh, the notices were given and I'd find out that the speaker the following week was a young man who used to go to YPF when I was the YPF leader. Didn't happen very often, but I'd just ask the secretary who I was giving the notice, can you just pass on a message? Three John four. And he went, mm, okay. The verse reads, and I hope you don't feel I'm being presumptuous in this. The verse reads this. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. I hope that you don't think that was presumptuous of me, but it gave John a great deal of joy to see his little children walking in the truth. For him, there was nothing better. And in his second letter, John summarizes, I suppose, everything that I've already tried to say tonight. Turn to, to, to 2 John and, uh, and verse 4. We'll read a few verses there as we draw to a conclusion. And the, the letter is, this time, it gets a, an addressee, at, at least, to the elder, and the, the elder to the elect lady and her children, who I love in the truth. In verse 4, he says this, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one we have had, there's that phrase again, from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who did, do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. I rejoice greatly because I found what? That you are still walking in the truth. Those things that you had heard in the beginning concerning the word of life, the Son of God. So John lays a solid foundation. Don't be taken in by the false teachers with their alleged special knowledge. Stay faithful to what Jesus said, what he did, as handed down to you by the eyewitnesses, showing Jesus Christ to be God, the eternal Son, promised in the scriptures, foretold by the prophets, 
and now heard, seen and touched by the apostles. Only then can you know true fellowship, both with other believers and with God himself. Our time has gone. Uh, obviously not being able to do that justice.